Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Big Bout Podcast. This is John Suntress. Sorry it's been so long since we've had a new episode. I uh, had a little uh, health problem, but uh, I am on the mend, and I promise more regular episodes moving forward. Uh, because of that, I wanted to uh, present an, uh, a conversation, a couple conversations, actually, that uh, I had years ago with a good friend of mine, my mentor as far as the fight game goes, Burt Randolph Sugar the wonderful former publisher of Boxing Illustrated, the former editor-in-chief of Ring Magazine, long association with boxing. He did a lot of work with HBO uh, both uh, on both sides of the camera and also of the microphone because a lot of times he would go to big fights and he was always available as an expert if there were TV or uh, radio stations that wanted someone to come on and, and talk about the big fight and as opposed to getting a Lampley or a George Foreman or a Larry Merchant or a Roy Jones. They would go to Burt Sugar. I wrote for Burt Sugar's Boxing Illustrated from 1990 till 1994. Uh, He left the magazine and Herb Goldman took over and became uh, International Boxing Digest, as I recall. Uh, And I just, I don't know, it wasn't the same. I I missed uh, hanging out with Burt. Had a lot of great uh, hangout time with Burt over the years. He came to Chicago for a book signing when he did the 100 Greatest Boxers of All Time. And it was uh, him and Leon Spinks signing autographs for two hours at a trade show uh, for convenience stores, a convention for uh, convenience stores. And it had all these different products that you would see. Uh, Nabisco was there, and Light Beer was there. Steve Miserak was sh- uh, doing trick pool shots. Um, John Havlicek was there for Skull Tobacco, and he was signing autographs. Suzanne Summers was there. For the Thigh Master, our favorite moment was walking by the Nabisco uh, booth, and all of a sudden we heard this very familiar voice scream, Hey, Leon! And all three of us turned around, and in unison we all said, Hey, it's Chubby Checker. Totally true. One of the funniest afternoons I ever had. We went to a sports bar afterwards, had a few, and just a great time with uh, Bert. That's when he and my uh, friendship really solidified. And then over the years, going to New York or Vegas, for big fights, I would always uh, make sure there was hang time with Bert. Um, really fun stuff. Uh, the Lennox Lewis Hasim Rockman rematch in particular was a great weekend that I got to spend with Bert. Also, uh, some uh, Oscar De La Hoya fights and uh, Chavez fights. Always a good time with Bert Randolph Sugar. And you're going to hear that in this episode of the Big Bout podcast because uh, I've got a couple conversations that I had with Bert that I did uh, for radio purposes. Um, First, you'll hear a nice, lengthy uh, talk about the early days of boxing. It was background stuff that I wanted for my Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney documentary that certainly you've heard on a previous Big Bout podcast. Um, this, there was a lot of uh, great stuff that I didn't end up putting in the documentary because I only had a half hour of radio time to get it all in. So you're going to hear a lot more about uh, Dempsey, some fights that didn't happen, like with Harry Wills. Some of the rumors, did Dempsey load his gloves? Uh, I should say, did Doc Kearns load Dempsey's gloves when he fought Jess Willard for the title? Uh, some of the things we talk about. Why? Uh, what happened to uh, boxing films uh, You know, in the early days before the 30s uh, from the, the first boxing film, which of course was made by Thomas Edison? So lots of interesting early 20th century boxing conversation in this first portion. So let's get into it. Here's uh, Burt Randolph Sugar. From 2002 on the Big Bout Podcast. What happened? Because obviously one of the first things that Thomas Edison filmed was boxing. Am I correct? Peter Courtney and James J. Corbett fought in the Black Mariah, which was a barn that turned uh, on Edison's property to catch the sunlight. And it was one of the first films ever shot by Edison. So boxing and movies went hand in glove right up to 1910. And then what happened? As a result of the riots after the Johnson and Jeffries fight, won by Jack Johnson, 15 rounds, in which I think it was 87 people were killed in about 12 cities, mostly blacks by whites who were upset that they were flaunting their newfound champion and power, Congress passed a law forbidding the interstate transportation of fight films. 
it was an era that was, I guess, best categorized by Victorian beliefs. There was a watch and ward society that basically banned uh, anything that uh, they found by those standards of those days salacious. They even had a a statute on the books of several states that women could be arrested for having their skirts more than three inches above their ankle. (laughs) It was a very moralistic society. And the last thing that society wanted was riots and particularly having the black man who had once been the white man's burden to now be his master and shown on film. Put them all together. Boxing films were banned until the mid-30s when the ban was lifted. Probably only because it had become part of our society and Joe Lewis, who was then the champion, a hero. So therefore, even these Dempsey-Willard films and the subsequent Dempsey films uh, of uh, Dempsey Tunney, Dempsey Carpentier and that, uh, they were filmed. So, So how would people see these films? Unless they were bootlegged, they didn't see them at all. But remember, it was interstate commerce, so if there was a fight film in a given state, you could see it in that state. You just couldn't take it across state borders. And uh, I guess, like the old joke goes, taking a uh, fish across state lines for immoral purposes. (laughs) You couldn't do that. Uh, And uh, they were filmed, and they were put away, many of them were basically reduced to historical archives. Some were vended, but not much money was made on them because of the law against their transportation and and showing. But it really wasn't their showing that was illegal. It was their transportation. It was like the Prohibition Act, which forbade everything, if you read it carefully, except drinking liquor. You couldn't serve it. You couldn't possess it. You couldn't in any way vend it, but you could drink it. Hmm. So the law being what it was, they could show them, they just couldn't transport them. So whoever showed them was not illegal, and people would see them. But again, they were bootlegged films for about 25 years. There was a period of no films being shown in mass media. I'm trying to envision this. I mean, were, were there guys then obviously breaking the law and, and you were literally seeing in back rooms, hey, kid, come upstairs for a nickel and you could watch Dempsey knock out Carpentier? Uh, no, I would suspect that they were shown in theaters. They were still shown in regular theaters? Yeah, I would say so. The problem being that uh, it was not a well-policed law. It's like most laws of Congress. Nobody enforces them well. Now, Johnson himself obviously got got in trouble for transporting women across state lines. The man well, it, that was the Mann Act. And it really was called, called the White Slavery Act. Howsomever, that's only been enforced three times. Only three people have ever been sent to jail for violating the Mann Act. The three people are Jack Johnson, who was taking a woman later to become his wife across state lines. Chuck Berry, and Charlie Chaplin. Those are the only three people it's ever been enforced against. Um, The Johnson, or I should say the Dempsey-Willard fight. Uh, Roger Kahn says that was pretty much the start of the Jazz Age. That's that's his feeling, or the golden age of sports. He, He pegs that fight as really being the one bookend. To start the golden age of sports, would you? It was the golden age of sports, not the beginning of the jazz era. Um, The jazz era had many starts. Uh, Predominantly, movies uh, did that, but um, flappers and music and everything else. Mm -hmm. Howsoever, when Paul Gallico, who was the sports editor of the Daily News, labeled it the golden age of sports, and he did that sort of retroactively. He worked backwards and put in the pantheon of the heroes of the Golden Age, Dempsey, Babe Ruth, Red Grange, Bill Tilden, and Bobby Jones. But the first he enshrined was Jack Dempsey, who in the 20s, believe it or not, 
was bigger and more popular than Babe Ruth. And Ruth himself was even jealous of Dempsey's popularity. They say that in 1927, the Dempsey-Tunney fight, the long count, was even more significant than Ruth's 60 home runs. It had bigger headlines even than the New York Times. On the front page, across the top of the front page, in banners that they usually only do, they only use for, or then they only used past tense for a coming of a war. And both sides of the paper were bedecked with stories of that fight. It was um, Back to Dempsey uh, Willard, uh, the rumor about Dempsey's gloves being loaded, uh, possibly pl- pl- plaster of Paris being used in the hand wraps of Jack Dempsey to, to ensure a first-round knockout. What, what are your, uh, what's your information on that? Bunkum. Pure Doc Kearns bunkum. The Milwaukee Journal actually tried an experiment, and it flaked at the first touch, not punch, <laughs> in the gloves they used in the experiment. It cannot be done that way. Let it be known, Dempsey sued Sports Illustrated and won, I think, $300,000. Wow. So you're welcome to spread the rumor. Well, certainly address the rumor and by all means discount it. (laughs) Yes. I think you're welcome to use this. Uh, No, it it, it is impossible to do as it was depicted. Jack Doc Kearns at the time was bitter at Dempsey. He had been dropped by Dempsey as his manager before the... Before the uh, second fight with Honey, and uh, was mad, had sued Dempsey, in fact, for money. And there was a countersuit, and he walked away very bitter with Dempsey and started spreading stories, and that was one of them. But uh, as, George, as George and Ira Gershwin said, it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> What can you tell me about the 1925 fight that uh, Kearns tried to set up between Dempsey and Harry Wills in Chicago? Well, Dempsey had no problem fighting Harry Wills. Another myth. Uh, The the problem is facts are a stubborn thing to dislodge. And everybody believes that Dempsey ducked Harry Wills. He did not. He fought many, many blacks. Denver Ed Martin's uh, first fight was against a black. The problems were threefold, number one of which was Tex Rickert, the promoter who promoted Jack Dempsey, vowed he would never have another black-white match, a mixed match after Johnson and Jeffries and the riots that ensued afterwards he felt responsible for. Number two of which, the New York State Athletic Commission did not want it in New York, which was Rickert's Balowick. They voted two to one against having a Dempsey-Wills fight, even though there was a signed contract by Dempsey, let it be known, and he had to refund a, uh, a forfeit money or give forfeit money when he couldn't go through with it. And number three of which was Wills was subsequently beaten. Uh, so he fell by the wayside, but it had nothing to do with the fact that Dempsey didn't want to fight him. He could have beaten him. Wills was way over the hill by this time, having fought since 1911. Wills was uh, beaten eventually by Sharkey, too, am I correct? Sharkey and a couple others, yes. Which uh, basically set up the uh, the Eliminator uh, after Tunney had beaten Dempsey for the title, uh, the logistic Eliminator that Sharkey would then fight Dempsey, and the winner of which would fight, uh, fight Tunney. And yet Sharkey had many important and significant wins up and through then. Uh, Sharkey was a legitimate contender even without the Wills fight. That was discounted even at the time as a major fight. It just was a postscript to Wills in much the same way as saying he was way over the hill as Mike Tyson was way over the hill when he lost to Lennox Lewis. Everybody knew that going in and coming out. It was ascertained. It was on a foul, by the by. Wills fouled him when he found he had no chance to beat him. Uh, but Sharkey was a legitimate fighter. In fact, in the fight with Dempsey, uh, Sharkey won every round but the last round, which was a knockout round in which he lost. Dempsey, who would do anything in a ring to win, hit him low. When Sharkey turned to the referee to complain, he hit him again in the jaw with a knockout punch. So even while Sharkey was 
complaining. He went down flat, face first flat and was out under that old adage of protect yourself at all times. Uh, give the postscript to that, Bert. I believe the press uh, asked Dempsey uh, if that was really fair play. You tell the story. Well, Dempsey, Dempsey in fair play, he, he just said, you've got to cover yourself up at all times. And he said it wasn't the first time I hit him low. That's I, all Dempsey had was hitting him low. I, I thought he. I thought the uh, the quote was, uh, you know, w- what were you doing hitting him low? You know, shouldn't you have waited? And he said, what was I supposed to do, write him a letter that I was about to punch him? That was one of his quotes. There was a lot attributed to Dempsey. I'm not sure he said all of them. Uh, I mean, you know, the, one of the my favorite lines was uh, when he came home and his, his wife, Estelle Taylor, after the first Tunney fight, said, what happened, dear? He said, I forgot to duck Ginsburg. Because she called him Ginsburg, so he responded. That was their cutesy-wootsy name for each other. But Dempsey was as nice out of the ring as he was a warrior inside. Many times he was the avenging angel of death just standing over his opponent. And that was his manner. He would knock an opponent down and stand over him. And what's of interest is in that the 1927 rematch, it was Dempsey and his camp that asked, that inserted into the contract, B, the clause that the fighter scoring the knockdown go to the neutral corner because he in his mind's eye thought if anyone would score a knockdown it would not be he it would be Tunney P.S. though everybody remembers the long count in the seventh round nobody remembers that Tunney knocked Dempsey down in the eighth there's a great picture of Tunney in the eighth round not in a neutral corner certainly giving ground to Barry and Dempsey and, and, and it seems to be sufficient ground for, for Barry to give a count. But certain people will look at that round and say, there's your proof that Barry must have been on the take for the Tunney side because where was he ushering t- uh, Tunney into the neutral corner where he didn't do it to Dempsey? But Dempsey was up at the count of nuns. He didn't even take a count of one. There wasn't time to go to the bathroom, let alone a neutral corner. <laughs> I mean, why is it boxing always has some element of quote-unquote fix to it? Why wasn't Don Denkinger in the Kansas City-St. Louis World Series when he called, made a call that was obviously wrong and controversial, costing the Cardinals the game and ultimately the World Series guilty of a fix? It's always attributed to boxing. But there's evidence of Capone, as we've discussed before, trying to fix the fight in Dempsey's favor. There's yes, evi- and with a referee who was discharged that day. There's also evidence of the Philadelphia mob trying to do the same for Tun- on Tunney's behalf. Well, uh, there is not evidence. There is rumor of that. Okay. The, Demp- the pro-Dempsey conspiracy I know of, the Tunney one is only a rumor. Okay. Uh, And yet the Capone hand-picked referee was discharged that morning by the Illinois State Athletic Commission for for Barry. And would you say Barry was an honest referee in your your estimation in in, in subsequent fights if you've seen them? I don't. I can't pass judgment. I mean, you know, he, uh, he seemed to be a sufficient referee. I don't think he made any more mistakes, good, bad, or indifferent than Eddie Cotton did in the Lewis Tyson fight. I have, <laughs> I have tape. Where he called a, a knockdown and a, 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 a non knockdown and called a non knockdown a knockdown. What do you think of uh, the HBO rebroadcast and 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 Stewart and Lewis's claim that uh, Cotton clearly was trying to give Tyson every advantage? No, what I think he was doing was bending over backwards to make it look as if he wasn't leaning on Tyson. You know, there was also that approach, i.e. Anything he does will be misconstrued if he does it to Tyson. Ergo, let me, let me uh, heavy-handedly do it the other way. Hmm. But, uh, you know, you, you cannot always mistake incompetence for finality. God knows I'd be the most venal person in the world. <laughs> um, I have tape, and it's, it's tape of Willard years after their, uh, the loss to Dempsey, saying that that fight was taken from him from the mob. And, uh, you know, if, if only the people knew 
and and it just really was an indictment on on what happened to him in the second round loss. And and if only people knew that you know really the mob's influence even back then on on the fight game. What what can you tell me about uh, about Jess Willard and and uh, can you can you summarize uh, Jess Willard as heavy, heavyweight champion or even as a contender? Well, Jess Willard was a strong rodeo rider. He was a rodeo rider who was the best of the white hopes. He had killed a man in the ring, Bull Young, and was given a chance against Jack Johnson because Jack Johnson was 36 at the time and had, hadn't fought but uh, twice in four years. And in 20, I think it was 105 degree heat, in the 26th round, he knocks Johnson out in a famed picture, theoretically, of Johnson covering his eyes, which explains that it was a fix. However, with the involuntary fall down, if you look at Billy Kahn in the second Lewis fight, he falls down the same way. Your limbs go every which way. And somebody caught a picture of that instance when his, his hand flies over his eyes. <laughs> But Jess Willard was a lumbering man, only had one fight, Johnson was 36 at the time, and had, hadn't fought but uh, twice in four years. And in 20, I think it was 105 degree heat, in the 26th round, he knocks Johnson out in a famed picture, theoretically, of Johnson covering his eyes, which explains that it was a fix. However, with the involuntary fall down, if you look at Billy Kahn in the second Lewis fight, he falls down the same way. Your limbs go every which way. And somebody caught a picture of that instance when his his hand flies over his eyes. Mm-hmm. But Jess Willard was a lumbering man. Only had one fight between 1915 and 1919 against Frank Moran, an exhibition in Madison Square Garden. It's really a no-decision fight, but he won 10 rounds through one punch. So in four years, he had one fight for 10 rounds. He was in no shape to fight Dempsey. In fact, if there was a mob influence, I must ask why Tex Rickard goes into Willard's room and asks him to take it easy on Jack, don't try to kill him. Hmm. Now, there was Jess Willard had many stories, but the best one is that when Jack Dempsey opened his restaurant in New York, his first bartender's name was Jess Willard. <laughs> That's wild. And obviously there was the, uh, if I'm right, the mural in Dempsey's was of the, of the Dempsey-Willard fight. Am I correct? Yeah, James Montgomery flags. A, wall, a mural on the wall of the, uh, of the famed uh, Maumee Bay Massacre, July 4th, 1919. Um, the, the period before the first Tunney fight um, and after uh, the Furpo fight, were there were there worthy challenges? Was it was it just Dempsey enjoying himself in Hollywood? Of well, he had one fight in Shelby, Montana, in the interim. Okay, so let's say let's say after that, then after after and the Tommy Gibbons, Gibbons fight. By, Tommy Gibbons, by the by, was a legitimate contender. Tommy Gibbons, uh, it was his style that Gene Tunney adopted. Tommy Gibbons was one of the cuties. And could go anywhere. He just couldn't beat Dempsey on a hot day in Shelby, Montana, in 1923. But between 23 and 26, there was no fight. He was in Hollywood, had his nose straightened, married a leading lady named Estelle Taylor. You might have seen her in the movie The Champion. Uh, she was, and she was a friend of Bud Schoberg's. Yep. Out of Wilmington, Delaware. It was his second wife. And he went Hollywood. Pictures of him with Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, on and on and on. It was during that time that he becomes estranged from Doc Kearns, mainly through the fact that his wife, Estelle, now takes part and parcel in hand in what he's doing, gets some movie parts. He's in a, a serial, he's in a, a, a movie. While he's a better actor than Babe Ruth, that didn't make him <laughs> Douglas Fairbanks. Uh, but, you know, he was Hollywood. He enjoyed the whole atmosphere. He enjoyed the hanging out. He was basically away and estranged from boxing. And for three years, there was nothing happening 
in the heavyweight division. And remember, it wasn't like it is today where they must defend every six months. I've just given you an instance of for three years Willard sat on the title. And the sport was content to allow Dempsey this sabbatical from boxing. Well, what's so interesting is that in the interim, 1922, they founded Ring Magazine. In 1924, they started rating fighters, and it was Jack Dempsey who rated them. It was called Jack Dempsey's Top Ten. Wow. But so he kept his hand in, but not his glove in. <laughs> but again, there was never never a cry for anybody that was being denied a shot and no, no well, challenge. Well, he signed to fight Willard, and, and that was as close as he got. Okay. Uh, which is probably why Tunney, continuing to win, was able to ascend to the position of mandatory contender. Or there was no such thing as a mandatory contender, but at least the uh, ascend to the, five, the the point where he is a a, a called for in, a champion in which there is a in which there is a um, a cry for the fight to happen because he's now viewed as a worthy contender, not a mandatory. Did he want that second fight against Tunney? Was he was he coerced into it? Uh, was it money? Uh, it, it seemed that he took such a drubbing in the twenty six fight. Uh, no, but the Sharky fight gave him hope. You know that he could catch Tunney. I mean, he had that belief. He was worried about his nose and his eyes, but he had the belief that quote unquote he could beat Tunney. And he was a sentimental favorite. It was interesting what had happened to public opinion and. And the long count even made him more of a hero. But here was a man as early as 1921 was viewed as a slacker, as witnessed the Carpentier fight. Carpentier, the hero versus Dempsey, the slacker, you know, mm -hmm. the... The World War II draft dodger. Yeah, you know, you, you know the uh, genesis of that, the picture of him uh, with a pitchfork shoveling hay uh, and with, his, uh, with his black patent leather shoes on. <laughs> And uh, he used uh, the fact he was a, he, he was a sole support of his wife Maxine Cates, who was a piano player hyphen uh, prostitute in a house of less than repute, and uh, his mother. So he was called a slacker. But by 1926, he has become so popular, and 27 reinforces it after the long count that he is the dominant sports figure, if not figure figure, of the jazz age. And really, with a yeah, let's put it in, in modern perspective, the Michael Jordan of his era. More, more. Michael Jordan has, Michael Jordan has to share it. He didn't. There were only five, pe four people he had to share it with. And he was head, head and shoulders above the other four members of and that. And Bobby Jones doesn't come along to twenty nine to thirty. Tilden twenty seven. Ruth twenty one. Two years after, and Grange twenty four. So they they come along in staggered years. So he gets he gets a free ride for a couple of years, and he's riding that almost free ride. And just amazing that during that decade, again, three years of inactivity, and yet still at the top of the pyramid. He is. Uh, his movies might have helped him. But the fact that in those days, the heavyweight champion was the strongest man in the world. It was a holdover from, from uh, John L. Sullivan. That was even before Mike Tyson coined it the baddest man on the planet. And, and Sullivan's great cry was? I can lick any son of a bitch in the house. <laughs> and he was proud to say it. Um, he also had another line. Some guy hit him one night, and he said, if you hit me again and I find out about it, you're in trouble. <laughs> All right, Bert, that's good for tonight. All right. Uh, I'm going to bug you again in the future. but uh, You got something there? Absolutely. No, stuff for... Because, like I said, I w I'm going to talk to Khan, and he, he had just mentioned how, how he felt that, that Willard obviously did start the Golden Age, that the Willard fight did. I, w I will accept that. I think but it was retrospective. I understand. I understand. But it'll work also with July 4th coming that I can do another web piece specifically on that. Yeah. And uh, regardless, you know, uh, while we're talking about Dempsey, you've given me more for my half-hour documentary, so that's cool. All right. And you didn't know that I'd know things like, Estelle Taylor, Maxine Cates, 
No, you're the man. I, I expect no. That's not true. I expect I expect nothing but an encyclopedic uh, memory from you. Bo Young. There was another name. That was a fine name to pull out of your rear. That was a very fine name to pull out of your rear. No, I like that. And the Harry Willis stuff was helpful too. Yeah, and that was that was uh, William Muldoon, who was head of the New York State Athletic Commission, voted against it. The only man who voted for it was a guy named James J. Farley, mm-hmm. who later becomes Postmaster General under Franklin Roosevelt. I've seen, yeah, I've seen his name uh, connected with boxing and, and obviously as Postmaster General as well. When did Eddie Egan become... Uh... In the 50s. In the 50s, okay. William Muldoon, who was called the, the old Roman and the strongest man in the world, and he was a wrestling champion, but he was an old, old fogey. He's the one who basically uh, put the Knicks, the, the kibosh on a Wills and Dempsey fight. Hmm. All right, Uncle Bert, we'll have a good time at Vegas. And I'll talk to you in a couple of weeks, John. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for your help, man. Bert Sugar from 2002 talking about uh, some background stuff of the uh, Jack Dempsey era. And obviously we got into a lot of other fighters as well. Even a mention of uh, Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson's fight. You know what I like about these conversations is the fact that uh, unlike when he would normally be on TV or radio, he was always talking about the fight of the moment. And, you know, Bert, he had his one-liners, you know, a guy is in a household name in his own household, things like that. Um, but And even on ESPN Classic, you only heard him talking about Marciano or Tyson or Ali and uh, Joe Frazier and, and George Foreman. You never really got to hear Bert talk about some of the fighters uh, that we discuss on uh, today's show, and especially uh, a lot of the earlier 20th, 20th century fighters. And uh, that's why I think this is unique and uh, also appropriate, given uh, my intent to uh, cover a lot of boxing's history on the Big Bout podcast. Good stuff. And uh, I've got a little bit more now from that same period. A few months later, I uh, decided to do a feature on Max Baer and uh, talked about a couple of his movies with Bert, uh, The Price Fighter and The Lady. And also later in the 50s, uh, The Harder They Fall. And if you heard my Bud Schulberg long interview, we get very much into The Harder They Fall. Also, Max Baer Jr., another uh, Big Bout podcast guest, uh, he spoke a lot about uh, Max Sr. and his involvement in uh, both his heavyweight career and also, again, involvement in The Harder They Fall. This is a little shorty, but uh, it's uh, there, there's a nice stuff here from uh, a little bit later. I want to say 2003 when I uh, spoke to Bird about uh, Max Baer. Now on the Big Bout Podcast. The Price Fighter and the Lady, the Myrna Loy film. He was a good actor in that. And also the key thing that I want to bring up, because well, there's a similar synergy to a modern movie, you tell the story about the Price Fighter and the Lady in terms of its relationship with real boxers. Well, in the Price Fighter and the Lady, Max Bear, Myrna Loy is in it. That's the lead. Max Bear is to have a fight with Primo Canera in the movie. This is while he's number one ranked contender for Primo Canera's title. And when they face off for the movie scene, which is a boxing scene, Max Bear says, you're not so tough, and he hits him. And Primo Canera cowered. <laughs> and at that point, Max Bear knew when they ultimately fought, he would beat him. As a PS to that, in The Harder They Fall, which is a takeoff on Primo Canera. Yes. Uh, Lane is the fellow's last name. I forget his first, who played Toro Marino, Marlino. Okay. Max Bear is the one who knocks him out and knocks him down 11 times in their championship fight. I have a more modern uh, synergy moment for this, and I'm sure you're aware of it. The remake of, or the, yeah, the remake of Ocean's Eleven they just did. I'll let you tell the story if you're aware of the facts of that. All I remember is that Lennox Lewis is in it. And... He is training there rather than going to South Africa to train for... He's training for a movie instead of a fight, and the fight is P.S. Hasim Rahman. The fight in which he lost his title just recently. Yes, in which Rahman became the greatest one-hit wonder since Millie Vanilli. <laughs> Do you know who he was fighting in Ocean's Eleven? Whom? Vladimir Klitschko. Or, or yes, Vladimir Klitschko. I can't tell the difference in those two Klitschko. I know you can't. But And perhaps, much like the prize fighter and the lady, we will see history repeat itself in that these two fighters fought each other on film in a fictitious way prior to actually fighting each other in the ring. 
I was at a, um, I was in a movie called uh, Play It to the Bone. No, the great, uh, yes, Play It to the Bone, in which the fight was to have been Mike Tyson and Alexis Arustikoff. Who's Alexis Arustikoff, if you don't know? It was a made-up name. Oh, okay. And I don't know if you saw Play It to the Bone with Antonio Banderas. And, uh, Woody, and, and Woody Harrelson. No offense, Bert. Haven't seen that one yet. Loved your performance in Night in the City. And unfortunately, loved your performance in The Great White Hype. Can't say the same thing about the movie. Mm, it, it was a cute movie. It, it was, it was, I'll forgive its you. Its problem man. was it was a, jo- a running joke that didn't. Run. Uh, uh, but it was, it, a, it, it was it, a running joke that walked or that crawled at a very <laughs> slow pace, Bert. Finally, I've got my last on-the-record conversation with Bert. Um, this was about six months, sadly, before he passed away. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if he uh, knew uh, what was going on with his uh, illness. He, he ended up dying of cancer. Um, there was something going on. I mean, we had a really nice conversation and uh, always friendly. And uh, through the years, always, uh, you know, would check in with Bert every couple of years or so. Uh, this is uh, back again in uh, 2011. And uh, we talk a lot about, um, you know, what's what was going on uh, then in 2011. The uh, Floyd Mayweather was uh, about to have a, a fight. And, of course, I predict wrong. We were wondering if a 37-year-old Floyd Mayweather uh, still had it. And uh, that's kind of ridiculous now when you think about it, given what he's uh, done in the last couple of years. Uh, but uh, it, it, it gives you more context. And also, a little talk about MMA and comparing it to boxing. Uh, HBO's uh, 24-7 series, we, we get into that a little bit. But a uh, nice little snapshot of uh, Burt's thoughts from 2011. Burt Randolph Sugar on the Big Bout Podcast. Very happy to have on the line my old boss back in his days as editor-publisher of Boxing Illustrated. Of course, the former editor and publisher of Ring Magazine, sports historian, Bert Randolph Sugar. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Bert. John, how are you? It's nice being here. It's nice being anywhere at my age. <laughs> well, you're spry and active, sir. I've uh, been seeing you on uh, the promos for some of the upcoming HBO bouts, and always happy to see you on ESPN Classic, uh, schooling the children and telling them uh, the way it was and the way it should be on the sport of boxing. Well, I guess I'm a traditionalist. I love the history. I mean, most people, if, if you mention Sugar Ray, they think Leonard, they haven't a clue about Robinson. It's a wonderful sport, but it has a history. It's like I once asked my grandson, who was president before Obama. He said George Washington. <laughs> well, he was technically correct. <laughs> And that's all these kids today are, is technically correct. They have no feel for what once was. This weekend's fight, Klitschko versus Adamic, we're not sure when the expiration date might be for uh, Vitaly Klitschko. I'm sort of, a, I guess, at a loss to define and appreciate the Klitschkos, both of them. In fact, I can't tell the difference. I think it's the same guy who walks in and out of a room. <laughs> changing his name and his clothing, and comes in. Uh, They are the most boring fighters I have ever seen. Now, granted, it's an Eastern European way of fighting, Mm -hmm. which is don't really extend yourself, don't put yourself in jeopardy, just do enough to win. And that's that long left jab. In fact, one of the Klitschko's begins with a V... Uh, scored a knockout in three rounds, a guy named Austin, I think it was, without landing a right hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just, and everybody tells you how great they are, they're dominant. They're dominant over what? Right. So, I, you know, the heavyweight division to me is on the cusp of being called off an account of lack of interest as far as I'm concerned, which is why we have so much interest in the middle area weight classes, and it's been that way before, John. Oh, yes. Go back to the 80s when Larry Holmes, great fighter that he was, there was nobody to fight. He was fighting people who weren't even household names in their own households, like Avazio Ocasio and Leroy Jones. <laughs> So we turned to the middle area weight classes, and we found a Sugar Ray Leonard and a Tommy Hearns and a Wilfred Benitez and a Roberto Duran and a Marvin Hagler. P.S. They fought each other, Indeed. every one of them. Indeed. 
uh, and we found that, well, we're doing the same thing again today. We, we, we've sort of lost interest. Good, good. Somebody over there win, whether it's Adamek or Klitschko or somebody. But we've got the real, the real action in boxing today is in the middle area weight classes. Obviously, the two biggest action fighters or people who want to see these action fighters as potential marquee matchups are Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather Jr. But there's so many others out there. There's Canelo Alvarez and uh, uh, even Andre Berto who fought last week. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And so what we're seeing is a regeneration of boxing and has happened many a time before in its middle areas and that's what's keeping it percolating if you will Un- understood first of all nobody's ever tried it but the Klitschko's can't fight going backwards yep even David Hay who three times I think moved forward <laughs> and I mean I didn't, what, a, what a terrible fight that was my leg went to sleep in the fourth <laughs> round and, there, and I followed in the fifth <laughs> But he came forward, and Klitschko almost tripped over himself trying to get out of the way. Yeah. They cannot fight going backwards. Ask Corey Sanders. I ask a lot of others. Indeed. Yes, against Vladimir. No, you're 100% right. And I'm trying to remember, who was the Olympian, Bert? Chris, um, and his father was the Olympic coach. Bird. Yes, thank you. Chris Bird, way back. Yeah, and when they made him quit. Right. He he had won 13 out of tw- uh, 10 rounds. Yep. <laughs> and his shoulder hurt. <laughs> I mean, all he had to do was stand there. Yep. Which is all he'd been doing anyway. And, and that, you wonder, you wonder about what what the grittiness is of the Klitschko's. Uh, and as such, it just bothers me that they are such terrible performers. I understand they're almost all winning, but I just don't want to see one guy out there with a left jab just using it to, you know, their, their jab so long they could sit in their corner and jab the guy sitting in his. And I think that's what they do. Goodness knows they are boar snores. <laughs> well, you mentioned you mentioned Andre Berto's win uh, this uh, past weekend. And as, as, as we look forward to uh, Ortiz's fight against uh, Floyd Mayweather, there is such a concentration of talent uh, all looking at Pacquiao and Mayweather. Um, it's it's funny. I read that Amir Khan this week is complaining he's going to have his last fight at 140 and can't seem to find any opponents. And as you say, the the great generation of 1980s middleweight fighters were all willing to fight each other. And and I I really think a lot of these fighters are doing themselves disservice waiting for the lottery to hit when a Pacquiao or a Mayweather comes calling. Berto, of course, almost you know talked himself out of a, a previous chance. At uh, at Mayweather, uh, I like Ortiz. Let's talk about the fight at hand, which is Ortiz and Mayweather. Uh, I mean, certainly Mayweather is the cream of the crop, pound for pound. But I I gotta say, I appreciate the gutsiness that Ortiz showed in the Berto fight, and even at twenty four, I think he's going to come at Mayweather, and certainly I, I don't think is intimidated by him. If he can catch him, we might be in for a very talented and interesting fight. I think it's interesting. Uh, his one. Chance. And follow this. He's had 29 fights, 23 knockouts, 22 losses, and two draws. In every one of those 33 fights, he has knocked his opponent down, win, lose, or draw. Yep. He is powerful. He's still a little rough around the edges, but he's powerful. Now, go to the other extreme. Who knows how much a 34-year-old boxing body can go through? At that low weight class, absolutely, sir. And with Mayweather fighting with all the frequency of Haley's Comet. (laughs) I mean, had two fights in 42 months, one fight in the last 16. You wonder... Not that he isn't great, but that if you're going to see the older Floyd Mayweather Jr. or just an old Floyd Mayweather Jr., I'll give you a dot, dot, dot. (laughs) I've already seen him slow down. He now only moves two steps at a time. (laughs) 
Honest Easter. to goodness. Lots I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. Um, well, you know, and he's kind of on the Marvin Hagler retirement plan right now, where if you, th- if you really look back at Hagler's last few fights before the loss to Sugar Ray, uh, he was doing the same thing, kind of fighting every 15 months as opposed to 12 months. And that, that has to be a very subliminal message of how much longer do I want to put myself through this? And as you say, at 34, um, these lighter weight fighters can grow old apparently overnight. I remember Don Curry being as great and lightning fast as he was and then, you know, showed up on the Royal Night and all of a sudden he just didn't have it anymore. Same with Roy Jones well, for that matter. I, I give you, I give you Benitez, Wilfred Benitez, a great defensive fighter. Absolutely. Uh, but look at the age 34, which just happens to be Floyd Mayweather Jr.'s age. At 34, the following great welterweights were already retired. Barney Ross and Jimmy McLarnon at 29. Tony DeMarco at 30. Kid Gavilan Wilfer Benitez, 32. Uh, I can go on. Uh, 33, Henry Armstrong. I mean, your body can just take so much. And granted, Floyd has never, with one exception, and that was in his last fight against Sugar Shane Mosley, been hit where he made him sit down in midair. Point of fact, it's still a 34-year-old boxing body. And I know I'll talk to people who are quasi-knowledgeable, not like you or hopefully myself, (laughs) and they'll say something to the effect of, well, you see Floyd throwing all those punches in rapid succession in this sparring and in his gym work. Yeah, and the next time I see him throw a combination will be the first time since the first Bush administration. (laughs) (laughs) Understood. And you're right. He has, he seemingly has lost a step going back to, you know, I go back to like the Angel Man Freddy fight when he uh, unified two of the belts at 130. Uh, you're right. I mean, there, there, there is something there. And as these middleweight fighters reach their mid thirties, yes, the expiration date, it's like checking the milk in the refrigerator every couple of days. You just want to make sure it's still good. Well, you know he's good, just how good. Yes. Wilfred Benitez, great. All of a sudden, he lost that little nanosecond that got him out of the way. He was uh, what Sugar Ray Leonard said was the hardest man he ever had to fight and hit. Couldn't find him. Once you could find him, you could beat him. And he started slowing down and getting the bejabbers beaten out of him. Understood. No, I remember it well. You're absolutely right, sir. Well, as as we know, and this is why I talked to uh, a historian such as yourself, y- you can't learn about tomorrow if you don't know anything about yesterday, and that's why we're talking. So, uh, and, and most of, mo- most of the so-called bloggers who follow boxing can't spell yesterday. <laughs> I use spell check, so I'm not going to make any uh, superiority comments. That's okay. That's why I stick to radio, okay. Bert. There's no spell check in audio. What do you think of yeah. in the last couple of years? Uh, HBO has uh, turned that 24-7 into a, a standard kind of feature. Uh, what are your thoughts on that uh, show? I think it's a soap opera, but it's excellent. Okay. What they, what they purport to be and have done and have won Emmys on it True. is to show the background of the fighters. Very little about the fights themselves. They're trying to capture... What ABC initiated for the Olympics is that up close and personal. Yes, indeed. And they've given it. They've given it a nice touch. And apparently because of the eyeballs, the viewership, they've managed to carry it off. And well, thank you. It reminds me, Bert, of the kind of thing we would get in reportage from great writers like Red Smith and A.J. Liebling, and it was those kinds of uh, think pieces uh, leading up to a big fight. It's that kind of narrative, and I have to say, soap opera aside, uh, they kind of succeed. And as you say, too, that that ABC Olympics uh, example that they did back, I'm I'm guessing it started in 76. I don't know. You tell me. Uh, They they touched base on it in 72, I think. Okay. Uh, you just reminded me something. You talked about spell check. <laughs> uh, the, the, the narrator, brilliant voice, Lee Shriver. Indeed. One of my favorites. Go on. And he spells his name L-I-E-V. Mm-hmm. They put that in the spell check, and it comes out Live Shriver. 
and they've got to go back and, and redo it every damn time. Because <laughs> I've been an advisor in some of those shows, and I hear screaming, they did it again! <laughs> Those are great, man. And, and, you know, HBO continues to make such wonderful documentaries. I love the Sports of the 20th Century series, and, and I'm glad to hear that you're involved with that. Are there any uh, good boxing uh, shows that are coming up, uh, newer boxing shows? Well, we're talking about it. I've got a couple, if you will, proposals on their desks. The problem is right now nobody knows who's sitting behind what desk because there's been a little bit of an upheaval. I just walk around going hide empty desks. YouTube has become a wonderful source for old boxing films. When you can't wait for ESPN Classic or somebody to kind of uh, show you something. And I was thinking, think about some of the non-title fights, or actually, I guess some of them were title fights, but ones that you just don't talk about. When you mention Joe Frazier, you of course think of the, the three fights with Ali, but my God, I was watching the two Jerry Corey fights, and uh, I forgot how great those fights were, and, and such all-action fights. And I think that's something that would be ripe for uh, an examination. Uh, yeah, and, and, and what we have is uh, it's interesting to open up a sport like that, to give it the background, to give it some, if you will, some some uh, a soul, I guess would be the right word. In other words, to bring in the fighter, not just as a man who throws punches. Sure. As a man, that is a man. Uh, who who uh, is worthy of a story? I mean, this is what you're looking for all the time. Absolutely, and and you know, I um, it's it's good to examine history, and and I and I'm glad that HBO does it to a degree, and I know that you know I hope uh, you continue to do it with the ESPN uh, Classic, and there there are times that they they look at the past because you see examples in other sports. I, I think, as you say, it does bring soul to the sport when you honor and appreciate its history and you really you know realize that there's a lot more going on than what happened in yesterday's newspaper uh, yes uh, <laughs> yeah there's no question there <laughs> there is a yesterday's newspaper it won't be there tomorrow there, fair enough well and also Bert tell me about this competition with MMA that boxing finds itself in I don't find it maybe I'm missing something okay I, have, I don't think it's lost one person I do congratulate, and I have to his face, Dana White, on building a whole new sport. No, it hasn't. Uh, it, 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 it's a Franken sport. It's many sports all wrapped into one, is what MMA or UFC or whatever the hell it is this week, because they're not quite sure. <laughs> you say boxing, you mean boxing. I got all these initials. That's good. But uh, what he has done, now, I'm not a big fan of what it is. I like nothing better than to watch two men, grown men, by the by, try to mount each other. I haven't seen that since Hate <laughs> Asbury. And I got two men on the floor trying to mount each other. Okay, I can watch this on Playboy or something, but it'll be girls. Hilarious. Uh, you know, it just doesn't appeal to me. But go back to your question. It's built its own audience. It's a much younger audience than boxing. Indeed. What it is in many ways is ex-wrestling fans who have now substituted real violence for the fake or, or choreographed violence of wrestling. Sure. It's real competition as opposed to performance. It. Yes, and that's its fan base. But congratulations to Dana White. He's done a great job of making chicken salad out of chicken droppings. <laughs> I mean, these are bar fights. I used to do this crap, John. Understood. We had, we had broken beer bottles occasionally. <laughs> you know, Bert, they, they want to tie it to a guy like Bruce Lee, who was a big proponent of doing mixed martial arts and saying, why not have every fighting technique available to you when you're competing? Um, I wonder, mentioning bar fights, I always thought a guy like Jack Dempsey could also be kind of thrown in their lineage just because of his background and coming from, you know, that kind of anything goes uh, barroom brawls he was doing when, when Doc Kearns first found him. Yeah, well, he was fighting in backs of bars, for crying out loud, sure. with sawdust on the floor. Story about Jack Dempsey, age 82. He's getting out of a cab, I think in front of his own restaurant on Broadway, and two men try to mug him. 
two punches later, they're lying on the street face down, and he's walking into his restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know exactly that story, sir. <laughs> I absolutely no, and and he's one of he's one of those great men of uh, of uh, the sports past, uh, you know. Uh, but also, I, I wonder. And granted, it was multi people, and maybe this is more like wrestling. But I remember uh, guys like uh, Bo Jack fighting in battle royals, things like that in well, the thirties. Oh, you no, know, that was that, that was grab asses at Manassas. Okay, <laughs> uh, you know, battle royals where they put usually they were all black uh, constituency, sixteen men, each of whom had a blindfold on. Wow. And the last man standing won. Well, Bo Jack, and there were a couple like Elmer Violet, Violent Ray, Yep. Uh, used to win by standing in the corner and just listening to the thumps <laughs> <laughs> and counting down. Uh, oh, it was Barb Barrick. Understood. And yes. Uh, yes, played on uh, black bodies in the South. But you know, boxing's come a long way, and, and but that, it's become more civilized. And maybe looking at just as a dot 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 extension to mixed martial arts, we become a more vicious society. If, as Bud Schoberg said, boxing is chess played with human bodies. Mixed martial art is grand theft auto played with human bodies. Understood. No, I understand. It's just, a, it's just a more vicious sport. But there seems to be, if you look at the games, even the ones my grandkids are playing, there is a thirst for violence, and that's what it's fulfilling. Understood. I, I just, um, and I'm not expecting to change your mind, Bert. I used to feel that way about <laughs> MMA. No, honestly. You must be kidding. No, I'm not going. I'm not going to try, and that's okay. And I, and I certainly respect what you what you're saying. Um, I do think that White, to his credit, went to the various states to try and clean up his sport and make it more palatable. And to his, you know, again, he's found a way to, you know, make all the states say okay. And even these other countries that were against MMA in the '90s are, you know, accepting his version of of MMA with the UFC brand. I think Strike Force too is doing a good job of, uh, I'll you know. You, I'll, I'll leave you, uh, Uncle John, with that thought. <laughs> As we both sail off in different directions. <laughs> And I thank you for having put up with me for low this half hour. All right, sir. I, don't, I, won't, I won't keep you, but I hope you'll come back. And uh, as always... I would love to. I would love to. You're, you're a good man. I, I appreciate your time. And uh, as always, uh, thank you for the wow. things that you've taught me through the years. And I continue to learn at the feet of Burt Randolph Sugar. So thank you, sir. Well, I'm glad somebody's learning from me. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk. Thank you, John. There you go. Uh, Burt Sugar, about six months before his passing... He uh, passed away at the end of March in 2012. Can't believe it's been seven years. I miss him. Uh, he was a great friend. We had a lot of uh, great hangout time in Vegas and in New York over the years. Always a good time. Uh, man, I'll tell you, the guys, you know, was a good 20-plus uh, years older than me and always had more energy than I ever had. And, you know, I'd, I'd wrap things up at 3 o'clock in the morning Vegas time. He'd go till dawn, most of the time because he was due on a television station or a radio station the following morning to uh, give comments for HBO on a big pay-per-view weekend. Um, a great historian, and really, uh, you, if you haven't ever read any of his uh, boxing books, you owe it to yourself to look up the 100 Greatest Boxers of All Time. Great baseball books. He wrote a history of ABC's Wide World of Sports called The Thr Thrill of Victory. Um, amazing stuff, and it's tough to find, but if you check your used bookstore sources, you might find a few of those. But just a colorful guy. What an amazing career, and uh, touched a lot of people. Um, Burt Randolph Sugar. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Big Bout Podcast. This is John Suntris. Thanks again for listening. More great stuff coming up in the days ahead. Make sure you stay tuned. Until next time, the Big Bout Podcast is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions. Copyright 2019.